Hello, hello. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. This is a podcast where I have conversations with other healers. Imagine that. It's not just a clever title. And we really talk about the intersection of of healing self while caring for others. My name is Sarah Bueno. And I am a licensed clinical social worker, psychotherapist in the Chicago, in Chicago. I was going to say Chicago land. What am I in the suburbs? I'm in Chicago. And uh, I also teach at a couple universities and I sing in a band on the weekends and I podcast. It's a fun thing. I get to do a lot of stuff. So I'm just excited to share today's episode with you and to let you know if you want to connect with me, probably the best way to connect with me is on Instagram. And I found these lovely folks on Instagram. And my handle is at Head Heart Therapy, which is the name of my practice here in Chicago. So you're going to hear from the women of Bliss and Grit, Vanessa Scotto and Brooke Thomas. So Vanessa is a counselor, meditation teacher, and Chinese medicine practitioner whose work integrates spirituality and psychology. In her early 20s, Vanessa's own struggle with depression and anxiety catapulted her on an academic and personal journey. Along the way, she earned two master's degrees and logged over 20 years of clinical practice. Brooke has been in practice as a manual therapist, a rolfing practitioner, and a movement educator since the year 2000. She is also the creator of the Liberated Body podcast. Her work is devoted to uncovering and celebrating how truly wondrous our bodies are these gorgeous organisms that connect us to our deepest clarity, our world, and each other. Together they host the podcast Bliss and Grit, conversations about being on a spiritual path in the modern world. So I hope you enjoy my interview with Vanessa and Brooke. Hello, Bliss and Grit friends. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much for having us on. Yeah. So for folks who are listening, if you are not familiar with the podcast Bliss and Grit, you will be familiar after today. And this is uh, Vanessa and Brooke joining us. Hello. Yeah. So glad to be here. Yeah. We've been writing each other for a couple months now, I think, trying to figure out a time. And my life has been insane. And, and it sounds like a lot's been changing for you guys. And so I, I just appreciate all the communication and connection. I'm That's just excited nice. we made it work. Yeah. So if you're cool, just jumping on in, I'd love for each of you to take a little time and share kind of who you are and what you do. The podcast, yes, but also all of the wonderful things that you are. I can start. It's Vanessa. And what do I do? Isn't that the funniest of questions in a way? Mm -hmm. It's almost bigger than talking about my childhood wounding. Right. But I am a coach. I'm a life coach. I got my master's degree in transpersonal psychology. So it's like spiritual psychology. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I just had a long history in Chinese medicine and Buddhism and and all sorts of different modalities. So the work I do with people is kind of eclectic and intuitive based, just kind of follows the flow of the relationship. And I am a podcaster on the phenomenal Bliss and Grip. Yeah, awesome. Brooke. I'm Brooke. <laughs> and I feel like we're in, sitting in a circle introducing right? ourselves. Yep. Yeah, so I have been a rolfer, which is a form of manual therapy or body work, for those who are not familiar, for about 20 years now. So my practice has been really primarily oriented towards the body for a long time. And through doing that in private practice, and then also through a podcast I ran before Bliss and Grit called Liberated Body, where I was really inquiring kind of about, well, what is a body? Mm. And got to talk to a lot of really diverse fields of people, you know, surgeons and yoga teachers and researchers. And it was like my through the looking glass moment where I popped out into this other dimension of reality. And I couldn't, the divide between the mind and the body just collapsed for me completely. And I was like, even the idea that there's a bridge didn't make any sense anymore, because I was like, they're the same thing. But this was after many years of practice as a rolfer. So from there, Vanessa and I started doing Bliss and Grit, because we've been friends for 15 years. And so we were having these conversations. And we actually met in Brooklyn at a wellness center that Vanessa ran. She was a Chinese medicine practitioner back then. And I was the rolfer. So our conversations were kind of always around body and spirit. And it's literally all we talk about. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That or food. Nerds. (laughs) (laughs) Nerd alert. Love it. (laughs) So we started doing that and we were 
going on retreats and doing trainings and wound up studying with Judith Blackstone in the realization process, which has become really important to me and have been able to sit with many other wonderful teachers. Another one who's super important to me is John Prendergast and his heart inquiry work. So long story short, I wound up bringing those things all together and I practice as what I call embodied coaching for lack of a better phrase, as a way of bringing all those threads together. So mm -hmm. that's what I do now in addition to Bliss and Grit. Awesome. So let's talk about coaching because there's a negative connotation from those of us who are trained as therapists. I see, yeah, Vanessa is shaking her head. And I actually, one of my best friends is thinking of transitioning from being a therapist to a coach. And so the thing that I've always been told historically is that a coach is very based in now and forward instead of looking at the past. But you both have really extensive training. And so you do have the licensure and the credentials to really hold deep transformational work. And because the word, there's a negative connotation in so many ways, I'm curious, did you think about other words? Like, how did you decide, fine, I'm going to call myself a coach if that was the process for you? <laughs> what was that like for both of you? I'll let Vanessa start with that one because, you know, and just to differentiate before she says her part, you know, you did your training, your master's in counseling and psychology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My training is in body work and then sitting with these teachers who've put together sort of somatic inquiry processes mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. Judith Black. So most of them are therapists or psychologists, but my background's a little different. Whereas Vanessa knows the, am I going to be a therapist or be a coach right. <laughs> route? Yeah. Yeah. I went to school. I was already a life coach at that time. I was apprenticed by a psychologist and the way he differentiated it from when he was doing therapy was his work was a lot of setting goals and then a lot of journaling when you weren't reaching them to get to the mm. deeper levels of what was potentially holding you back. So I had learned that, but when I was doing that, I felt like people are just getting more neurotic. Yeah. It's not necessarily inviting self-love. You know, I achieved goals and it didn't really make me feel better. Right. So I became interested in more depth, right? Like how do we sit with people in a more depthful way? So I went to school to learn psychology and to be trained as a therapist. But in the process, it's interesting, Sarah, I never really wanted to be a therapist. I mm -hmm. never particularly wanted that container, mm -hmm. which is interesting and very different than the vast majority of my classmates. And the only thing I can say, and this is just such a personal exploration, it's just my interpretation of what was arising in me, was a few things. One, there was something about the container of therapy and the way that you can't self-disclose and kind of cross barriers, whether they be in touch, because I was a Chinese medicine doctor and sometimes at the beginning, now I don't, I was inclined towards different aspects of touch could be present. I was still inclined towards, you know, if they had anxiety disorder, being like, um, are you drinking a lot of caffeine? How about sugar intake mm -hmm, and giving mm -hmm. them nutritional things, right? Mm -hmm. And this is going to sound really crazy. It's funny to talk about with the therapist, but I just looked at the frame of therapy sometimes and how it was showing up in the collective unconscious. Like, like I'm broken and I go to this person and they're like my idealized parent and they can never really say they're not, which of course we know therapists break that rule all the time as is appropriate for them. And I just wanted something different that and Quite honestly, by being a coach, I could work with people over Skype, which I wanted. Yeah, true. And I could feel free to bring more spirituality into the conversation in a way that felt really fluid to me. So yeah. I just decided, you know what, this is what I'd done for years. I was ready to get started. This is what I wanted to do. I used to see people in person as well. And the way that I look at it is you always wind up going back to someone's past. But that's simply yeah. because it is in the present with them, right? Right. So I'm not inquiring. I'm not doing mm -hmm. a an intake that would take them back into their childhood mm -hmm. or, you know, any of those origin stories. But when I'm sitting with people, of course, sometimes the past comes forward. The way I differentiate it is I tend to only work with very highly functional people. Oh, Maybe okay. they have a background in trauma, but at this point, their trauma has been pretty well processed and, and sorted and sat with. 
If not, I will refer them immediately, especially if there's mm -hmm. some capital T or developmental trauma that yeah. they really would benefit from being in person with someone. They would benefit from a specialist. Mm -hmm. So I tend to work with people who actually they've done a lot of therapy and now they want a new insight or some new tools. And in particular, they want to look at their experience through a spiritual lens. Yeah, we're definitely gonna have to dig into the spiritual stuff. But I want to give Brooke space to talk about her transition from just working with the body to the coaching aspect. Yeah, well, similar in that my clients are definitely very high functioning. And Vanessa and I are lucky because so many of the people who find us now find us through the show. So they have a ton of groundwork about what is this work yeah. and what are the expectations? Because for sure, life coach is not a phrase I would have picked. Oh, you I know? hate it too. If I, it has a I lot of associations that are really negative and also things that make me particularly nuts, like the goal setting stuff that Vanessa right. mentioned. It can make us so much more neurotic and it, it just keeps whittling us down to our accomplishments and just keeping us on that striving, 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 like always grasping, I'll finally be better. In many ways, it can be like the self-improvement project gone wrong at its worst end and be really future oriented where you never get to actually exist and like come mm -hmm. home to yourself. And I'm already worthy of existing. I'm already good enough. But of course, that's our frame on the show and Bliss and Grit. So the people who listen to the show already know that the, I'm not going to be helping them set goals of some time in the future, whether it will finally be mm -hmm. a better person, that that's not the orientation at all. But doing the the training with Judith Blackstone in the realization process, I think almost everybody in that training that we did, Vanessa was a psychotherapist or MSW. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was a, one or there was two. one other woman two. I can think of too. And guy. Right. And guy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Where we were in body work fields. And at the time I thought, because of everything I had been doing on liberated body, this will be so helpful to bring into my manual therapy sessions for people who are dealing with chronic pain, because chronic pain is so often about confusion in the nervous system yep. and stuff that hasn't been processed from the point of view of awareness, like where have you contracted mm. your body or where mm, have you mm -hmm. vacated your body and how can I guide people there? So initially I was imagining, oh, I'll just meld these and be able to really help people with chronic pain way more, which is my background. That's how I got into rolfing. Mm. I grew up with chronic pain and neurological issues. And then it just didn't work. It felt like I was trespassing consent boundaries that I didn't want to, even with people who knew my work on Bliss and Grit and Liberated Body and were seeing me in practice for the combination. I was like, there can be something so manipulative. And this is why therapy draws this line about having your hands on a person mm -hmm. <laughs> and asking them to inquire about something that's vulnerable and hurty to them. It yeah. just felt like, nope, <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I do not want to do this. There was just too much risk of taking away agency there. And Judith Blackstone's work does very little hands on. If it is, it's really just to bring people's attention to like, here's your here's your leg, you know, so that awareness can track it better. But this way I was attempting to combine didn't work for me. So but it was really meaningful to me in a clean and clear way worked with that. And at the same time, I was also had the opportunity to sit with John Prendergast, who's become a very important teacher to me and his way of doing heart inquiry combined with realization process was such a good sweet spot for me and was working so well with the clients that I didn't want to call myself just a realization process teacher. You know, like so many of us were in these margins and mixing and matching different things. And so I figured embodied coaching mm -hmm. was a way of pointing towards a field that people had a frame of reference for that if I'm a coach, I'm not a therapist, and I will refer out if therapy is what you need. Mm -hmm. But embodied coaching had more of a present tense flavor to it and also pointed to the fact that it was going to be about using soma and being as our guide and our way of, of getting in there. So that was what I came to. And it's been a few years now of working with clients in that way. And I find it really deeply satisfying. And, you know, just like with Rolfing, if somebody comes to see me and they clearly need to see an orthopedic surgeon, <laughs> You know, I know the markers of when I am not going to be the fit for this person because they need something else. And as with coaching, I'll refer out and I am have benefited tremendously, particularly from trauma therapy and a variety of forms. So 
I am thrilled to refer people to a good yeah, trauma right. therapist if there's that amount, you know, of density that needs clearing initially. Yeah. And as both of you were talking, I'm just thinking about we're being called to step out of the binary and to step out of like the I'm a therapist, I am a this, I am a that and to expand really. And that's what I hear about your work is that you've really kind of just created this. This is just you. You know, and you are delivering something that's so personal to yourselves and able to connect with others. And and yeah, it's it's so hard to just like define this is what I am. This is what I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And it's funny, I'll start a sentence and then not finish it because I have the other sentences like already on deck, ready to go. But we can relate. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So I get in trouble very often because <laughs> I really dislike cognitive behavioral therapy, especially when we're talking about trauma and everybody has developmental trauma or at least developmental injury in some way. Right. And I get in trouble a lot with other therapists who are like, but no, it's not just blah, 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 blah. But it's hard for me to find other therapists to refer to a ton of them. Anyway, I've got a great like network here in Chicago, but it's hard to find people who really do this expansive depth work. And this is what I'm just seeing. People are hungry for this. They're starving for it. And it sounds like you, you guys have found them as well. For sure. And, you know, Brooke and I both, I think I can speak for her. We're we're at the place where we are because we have been so attuned and curious about our own healing processes, yes, right? As yes. as per your show. So we've meandered a lot, right? Like we mm-hmm. we got a lot of theories. We've interviewed mm-hmm. a lot of people from multiple disciplines. We've had a lot of training. We've sat with a lot of awakened teachers. We've done a lot. And we take all these theories and then we go through our own healing process and we say, how does this vet out? Is this helpful? Isn't this helpful? So when you look at something like CBT and, you know, I never studied a lot of CBT because my school Mm -hmm. was a depth school. But what I understood, like the little bit I understood, I think it's really helpful to question your thoughts and to work Mm -hmm. at that mental layer and to see where your belief systems are. But what I had found for myself is that wasn't cutting it because some of the earlier developmental trauma was pre-verbal. Yes. And so then we needed to get into the soma. And then we weren't trying to really create a new, more positive belief. Right. But rather have a new, more profound experience of the truth of who you really are. So it's like these things are helpful, but... My curiosity is like, what happens when you apply them to someone like myself and like Brooke Mm -hmm, and like mm -hmm. yourself, Sarah, who've been through hell and back? Mm -hmm. And is your life looking different? Are you feeling different? Like what happens when the rubber meets the road? So there's no particular discipline where I say, "Ugh, not that one. (laughs) But, you know, I think a lot of times Brooke and I have spoken about this in depth with each other. One of the dilemmas we see when someone creates a method or when someone preaches any particular kind of method Mm -hmm. is they act as if that's it. That's the end all be all. And what we've found is we've used multiple different methods to unlock trauma and emerge in a new way. And to have the curiosity outside of any kind of dogmatic box, Mm -hmm. I think it invites for much deeper and more thorough healing Yeah. And it's also just, and particularly, and maybe we'll talk about this a little more in the spiritual realm, Mm -hmm. it's a good safety measure (laughs) that you are getting to sit with and learn from a myriad of different teachers because there's so much confusion around what the word spiritual means, what an awakening is. And so, of course, you know, people who might have a certain amount of awakening outside of what their ego structure is, it does not mean that they're psychologically mature. And we're never not Mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. who have psychology, too. So this many, many teachers, many models, many ways path has been really close to the heart for both of us. Yeah. Well, Brooke, what do you define as spiritual? What does that mean for you? You know, spiritual is a word that has gotten really, really wrecked, <laughs> like like so many words mm-hmm. do. What it evokes for most people these days, I think, is either something woo-woo or maybe mm-hmm. something connected to an Eastern religion 
or maybe it has something to do with meditating. I actually define spiritual as a true meeting of our actual human lives. You know, it's becoming fully, deeply human to the point that we are outside of all of the unconscious and innocent but brainwashing <laughs> that we all get culturally, individually, through our family structures. What happens when we start to have experiences outside of that conditioning? What are we mm, then? Yeah. And this is where people get really confused, right? Am I am I wide open space? Am I do I have no emotions? Am I never triggered? Do I have no personality and I wear flowing robes? Like what? <laughs> and actually I think it's just that we get really intimate with life, so intimate that we know that we are life and so we can really trust it. And I am Brooke. I'm always going to be Brooke. I get to have this experience for a brief period of time. I have no memory of what happens before or after. I, I have zero idea what that is. But what I know is right now I'm seeing, I am consciousness, seeing from this one's point of view. And the more I can understand that, the more I can really meet whatever comes my way with an affectionate curiosity or with compassion and be deeply engaged in my life, which is very different than like, I kind of took trauma therapy, which again, lifesaver, huge advocate mm -hmm. for how helpful that was for me. But I took it to, I wouldn't say the end of a road because it continues to be an important part of my life. I'm sure it always will be. But I realized that I was using it as a way to get myself together, like how to be the together person again, tidy it up, buff it up, be shiny, be together, be high functioning. And those things are nice. But there was a, a fork in the road where it was like, or <laughs> you could just tear down all the walls and see what happens then. And it was the choice that I made. Mm. And as you were talking, I was, I'm in the midst of a lot of trauma work right now. I think Vanessa, you and I were talking about, I told you NARM is the therapy that I've been oh, yeah. doing. I would love for you guys to check it out. It's Yeah, I'm not familiar. It's just incredible. And what's happening in my brain, and I like I feel, I feel this desire to come outside of the binary and to be able to like everything you were saying Brooke I'm like yes I want that and there's something inside of me that won't let that happen and I'm curious how much of it is you know the human brain is structured in a certain way that we want to categorize we want things to be binary we want to be able to make it concrete and explain it and how much of that is just my trauma that is the lens that I have and hopefully one day maybe I'll have an answer to that question but Particularly when you talk, I really I hear you having it's funny because I, I wanted to say the word arrive and that's not the right word. Right. See, this is the, my problem is like, no, how do I, I can say I haven't arrived anywhere. No, but, but <laughs> I can confirm that. <laughs> but in a space where it feels like the binary is you're able to access that easier than I can. Let's just say that. And I'm not trying to compare myself to shame myself, but I'm just I'm in awe of it. And that's that's something that, of course, like NARM is very not goal oriented, but I am a three Enneagram and I have oh. shit to do. <laughs> Vanessa and I both love yeah, the Enneagram. Okay. Yes. What are you guys? Well, I thought I was a nine, but I don't know. I was like challenged oh, that on that just the now? other day. Oh. So I don't know. I've, I've sort of given up because I'm not sure then. Interesting. I've gone back and forth between thinking I'm a four or a two. These ah. days, I think I'm a four with a three wing. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. That yeah. That probably I'm, makes the most sense. Yeah. I'm a three and both my four and two are very, like it's, it's pretty much 50, 50 split between those two. That's really mm -hmm. funny. Mm, good times with the Enneagram. Oh my God. I'm obsessed. <laughs> I just hired an Enneagram coach because I want to dig into it more. I'm just, I'm obsessed. But so yeah, anyway, back to that idea. I'm very like, I need to achieve. I need to do these things. And I know I'm being called right now to unwind that. And it is an excruciating process because now I'm going to cry because then who am I, right? It's this like ego yeah. death that is so, so necessary and so terrifying. Yeah, it's so terrifying to bump up against the boundaries of our identity. Yes. And I think that's fairly primal and right. and it's reflected in earlier trauma if we've had fears of annihilation that were very genuine. But we we all will feel that as we bump up against the edges of our identity. Yeah. And what's beautiful is as I've softened through some of this, you, you start to see that like you can still be you, mm -hmm. but now your achievement is for play, not because your life depends on it. Yeah. Your achievement is for joy, not because your whole sense of self-worth depends on it. So mm -hmm. it's not as if we all just become 
from these oming, you know, people sitting in a room who want nothing and need nothing. But it is the dismantling of the idea that my worth or my safety mm-hmm. and or my mm-hmm. safety are entirely dependent upon me upkeeping a certain identity. That's a perfect way to put it. And I cannot wait to listen back to that and <laughs> like make that a mantra for myself to just breathe that in. Yeah. And Brooke and I have both felt what it's like to experience an identity deconstructing. And for me, there was a lot of terror. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of confusion. It's like a, you know, it is an identity crisis. If if not this, then who am I? And you're leaving behind all the markers that your protective personality used to say, Mm -hmm. this will make everything okay. Right. This is what your limbic brain decided in its innocence was going to make everything okay. And in your consciousness now, in your maturity, you're saying, no, I don't need this anymore. No, there's another way. And your limbic system and all of your survival strategy just gets, you know, eruptive. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult. It's difficult. The nervous system goes kind of bananas. And at that point, you know, the saving grace I had was self-compassion, softness, love, and really good support from other people. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why we we have to do this bridging, or it would be great if we could do more and more bridging of all of the disciplines, because on the spiritual side of the equation, they're really missing the psychological piece. And they're really not paying attention to nervous system regulation. You know, I have something in my personality, maybe it's my three wing, where I can have a tendency to be like pedal to the metal, like go fast, like my survival brain has a lot of flight in it, which is like quickly get to safety, quickly do anything, sacrifice everything, but get to safety fast. So I took on my spiritual path in that way. So I, you know, sort of popped out of a lot of my conditioning and my identity really fast. And it triggered a very, very hard dark night because I just had a lot of unmetabolized PTSD in there that I wasn't aware of. I had done a bunch of trauma therapy. I had been sober for a while. You know, all those things were in place, but I just didn't realize because it was unconscious material how much more was there. Mm -hmm. And then I had to be able to have great support and to be able to apply how do I regulate a really dysregulated nervous system? You know, so it's not a good idea if we have trauma or a lot of dysregulation to just blow ourselves up spiritually. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And there's a real intelligence, you know, like you were saying, you, you know that you want and you need to engage with this process right now. That's so intelligent. Like, get some regulation. It's okay to have some ground underfoot. It doesn't have to always be pulling the rug out from under us for some spiritual goal. You know, it's funny. Life has just done that for me. And I'm like, "Ah!" (laughs) it'll do that. I'm tired. Right. (laughs) Well, I think this really leads into the question of whether or not you two would call yourselves healers. I mean, Probably. I, I don't know that I'd introduce myself that way at a party because it I'm a seems healer. a little pretentious. <laughs> I love that picture. What do you right? do? I business healer. card healer. Brooke mm-hmm. Thomas healer. I have seen that business card. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it's out mm-hmm. there. If we can recontextualize what that word means, right. you know, because ultimately we're all healers, even the mm-hmm. most challenging among us. But yeah, my work, my life's calling has been about whatever this thing is called healing or whatever this thing is called transformation for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a funky word, isn't it? It's got so much beauty in it and it's got so much confusion in it as well. I mean, it tends to create ideas that I am the one who's doing something to someone who's in need of healing. Right. And it builds in that experience of hierarchy yeah. and of powerless on behalf of the person who's in that role of receiving healing. Mm-hmm. So there's this funny thing about labeling yourself that because it's easy to then get into the mind frame of whether you're the patient or the pr- practitioner, it's easy to get into the mind frame of there's someone else who's going to help me or I'm the one who's going to help them, which then exhausts us as practitioners. And it's not really the most supportive dynamic I've found for people in healing processes. So I like what Brooke said, and and I agree, you know, to a certain extent, if we just relax around the word, it's like, well, I have devoted my entire life 
to studying on an internal level and with clients the process of healing. So if anyone's a healer, why not me? But at the same time, I just think healer implies healy and it can be a really slippery slope. Well, and again, that just kind of goes back to like having these concrete definitions for things. And what I found when you ask the same question a hundred times, we come up with the same answers. And it's it's that, yeah, if there's a power differential, that's not what I'm interested in. If there is, you know, this is my responsibility to heal you. I'm not interested in that. But I am someone who helps create space. I am someone who has a lot of wisdom from the training that I've been through and my own personal experience. Then, yeah. Yeah, and healing happens in our presence. We have certainly witnessed a lot of healing, so if that qualifies. Right. And there's something else that you said, too, that I'm going to just geek out on NARM for a second, because you guys continue to use the language that they use in the modality. And one of the things that I'm finding for myself, so on the receiving side, I find myself pushing away agency because I want the I want the therapist to tell me what to do, right? And I'm sure that's like childhood shit where I was taking too much control, right? And so now I want I want the adult to like tell my child self what to do and take care of me. And then as a therapist, I'm finding how subtly I have put the onus of, of healing on my client. And when they do the thing that I do to my therapist in therapy, I'm like, I'm giving you this fucking agency. So take it right. <laughs> like, what the fuck else do you want from me? You know, and it's so it's just so interesting, because it really gets to these very subtle, deep levels. And that unwinding is my perfectionism that is keeping me stuck in this place of judging and having a goal and, and all sorts of things like that. It's just, it is the most fascinating modality I have ever come across. Well, I think if you use perfectionism in a more holistic container and you realize it's a survival strategy, yes, it just takes on a different color. And, you know, I've had this experience where your clients ask you questions, right? Like when they sort of wish you would give them an answer. And, and I come to an interesting place with it where sometimes I realize like, that's okay. It's very innocent. When we were young, people were meant to teach us skills and tools. They were meant to show us like how to communicate, how to ask for what we want, how to set a boundary, how to regulate our nervous system. They were meant to show us that. And when we didn't receive it, like all of a sudden we wake up, we're 35 years old, we're walking around the world, we don't know how to do something. And now we're not supposed to ask because we're supposed to have agency, right? And what I've found, and it's a, it's an intuitive thing, you, you kind to feel your way through with the client as I know both of you do. But sometimes I will say, oh, okay, let's walk through that together. Now, of course, I'll never make decisions for them, take responsibility for them. I'm not a big advice giver, though it may sprinkle out of my mouth from time to time. But there is something very, I think, important when someone asks in innocence, like, hey, I need your help. Like, can you help me know or see or do things differently? that it's okay that if we have a different experience, we can offer it to them. Well, how does the term wounded healer sit with either of you? It's funny, I'm I probably mean, more comfortable accepting that, right? Me too, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Of it. course. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny, it's usually one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's usually if I can take on healer, then I don't like the word wounded, and so I don't want to identify that. But if I don't right. like the, yeah, it's it's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It gets to power dynamics a little bit, right? Wounded healer points back to something that we both hold really sacred, which is like, we're all human beings here. And we're never not human beings, <laughs> as long as we're in one of these things called a human body. So wounded healer is just a way of saying like, I might have a deep calling and commitment to healing, and it comes from knowing <laughs> that path. And I think that having been in this field for 20 years, the health, wellness, healing fields, I certainly understand both in myself and in other people the pitfalls of the wounded healer archetype. You know, I understand the downsides, but I think the tremendous upside is that we really know it from the inside out. And so we aren't going to be glib about it. And we're not going to be hard hearted because on the face of things, if you haven't experienced some of these realms of experience, if we want to call them that, it would be very easy to be really mental about them. You know, like I, I, one of my favorite Saturday Night Live skits is of the psychotherapist 
who <laughs> the couple is describing, you know, it's couples therapy, I think, and describing, oh, he's cheating or she's an alcoholic or whatever. And the therapist's only response to the whole session is, well, stop doing that. <laughs> oh, isn't that the Bob Newhart? <laughs> yes, it was stop Bob it. Newhart. Stop well, it. Well, stop it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you should stop doing that. Uh -huh. You know, it would be really easy to get to that place if you haven't been inside a hell realm and had to find mm -hmm. your way out. Mm -hmm. And that really opens the heart. And I think that open hearts is what we need <laughs> in mm. healers and wounded healers, how we get there. Right. Yeah. Vanessa, what are your thoughts on the term? I agree with everything Brooke had to say. I mean, I, we could probably stop it there and I would say she pretty much expressed <laughs> it, but I would add, you know, I don't want to imply we have to have wounding to be helpful, but it sure is helpful. And, you know, I know this could just be a narrative I tell myself about life and I'm okay with that, but I do think that it feels comforting to me to imagine that some of the things I've endured and experienced have been there and that they allow me to be in service of others because mm -hmm. there really is something about walking each other home. And if you haven't, as Brooke said, traversed a certain terrain and you don't have to traverse everything, but you know, just mm -hmm. known what it feels like to be alone or stuck or like desperately wanting something to be different, but desperately bound up in your survival strategy, then sometimes you're just not able to meet them where they are. And there's something like the wounded healer always gives me this visual of like, you're meeting someone like you're kind of traveling down this road to meet them in, in the dark places where they are and whatever the basement shadow material is. And you're holding their hand and you're saying, look, you can walk up this way. And you're patiently and lovingly just walking them up into a new level of experience. And so I think comfort in knowing, you know, the wounds of people who support me. That's one of the things I didn't like about classical therapy when there's no self-disclosure. And I'm not a big, believe me, I don't talk about myself all the time when I sit with my clients. But when there's no self-disclosure, like I kind of want to know I'm sitting with a human who's helping me be a healthy human. There's something very bonding in realizing that this person who sits with you has been through something and hopefully maybe they've come out and either on the other side or at least they've learned to sit with this thing in a way that makes life softer and more miraculous. Well said. Something I'm so curious about is why is it that some people come to heal in this lifetime and some people don't? And what is it? You know, it's not just resilience. There's there's something else. What was it inside each of you individually that said, I am here to transform in this lifetime internally? I mean, I feel like we're sharing the passion of that path. And for me, it's funny, my therapist is always trying to give me back agency. And I'm like, but this wasn't a choice. Like, this is what I am supposed to do. So I'm curious what that experience was like for you. Well, I mean, my first answer to the big question of why, why some people and others, mm -hmm. I, I have no idea that's between the mystery and itself. But when I look at my own path, like, why, you know, how did I manage to even understand that I could keep going, you know, and that there was a thing called healing and that there was life after healing too, even though it's also ongoing, you know, that I can just be a person who enjoys her life. But, you know, some of the important ingredients, one is awareness and that is also about the mystery. Like, I don't know why, but ever since I was a child, I remember I still have crystal clear memories of looking around at the adult landscape in the neighborhood I, I lived in and just being like, something's not right. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> this shit ain't same, right. Same. There's, there's mm -hmm. some, yeah. There was always a lot of awareness. There was also awareness about who was a warm or safe person mm -hmm. in terms of peer group and who is not doesn't mean I always only hung out with people who were the tops. I had trauma. So I hung out with a lot of people who were pretty harmful because I couldn't discern that. But there was still mm -hmm. there was something about awareness and then a real curiosity kind of to your question of like, what is this thing yeah. that we are doing called having a human life? And like, why is there so much pain here? And I don't want there to be so much pain here in me. And also for all of us, like, I feel like my whole life has just been this really deep 
prayer of less hell, please, for the humans. Yes. Like, please, can we <laughs> yeah. can we bring our divinity here more and really enjoy and delight? If we're going to individuate as people and be here, wouldn't it be great if it could be like more on the joy end of the spectrum? And there's a lot of that. But having experienced a lot of the opposite and observing it in others, there was just a really strong prayer for that. And then, you know, the classic ingredient that we all have, which is like suffering, right? <laughs> there was there was suffering. I had a birth injury, which I'm sure set up dysregulation in my nervous system. I grew up with chronic pain and neurological issues. So there was always stuff that made me feel apart. And then there was, you know, various traumas, things that happened. And those things hurt enough that at certain points, multiple points, there was just a big like, no, <laughs> in me, enough. This is enough. There has to be something other than endlessly suffering with this wound. And if it didn't hurt that much, I don't know. But for me personally, I don't know that I ever would have gotten to all of the places where I was like, no, mm. <laughs> enough. Yeah. I mean, so something that I heard in there that I really want to highlight is that feeling the pain, feeling the pain is what led to, I have to, I have to stop this. I have to do something else. And that just makes me think of folks that I've worked with or people I've seen in my life who do a really good job of numbing or dissociating or compartmentalizing away the pain. And I, it's, yeah, I'm into it. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I mean, I was a classically good dissociator, but even that strategy runs out at certain moments, you know, even that strategy can collapse. And on Bliss and Grit, we often quote this quote from Reverend Michael Beckwith, who says, something like pain pushes until vision pulls. Mm. And so I oh. imagine one can go on a transformative journey because of vision alone. I mean, I'd like to meet them. I feel at a certain level, that's probably true for all of us. There was just this innate drive for truth an innate existential curiosity, the, the innate wanting to unfold into our fullest potentiality. And that's the vision pulling. But like what Brooke said, it was the pain that was pushing at my back and I could only numb out for so long, right? And then it would collapse and you'd numb out. And really pain is not just internal, is it, right? The more confused thinking you have, the more developmental trauma, the more the pain shows up in your external circumstances. You choose relationships that you know, are not satisfying or, or safe, you know, you make business choices, you compromise yourself, you do all sorts of things. So even people with great dissociation or compartmentalization can get confronted by life circumstances. And really, ultimately, when you get to the point where you start to wish that you would die, you realize like, oh, I guess I better do something about this. And that was, you know, a lot of what happened. I was great at dissociating and kind of floating above and holding on to the transcendent view. I didn't know that was what it was called at the time until I started in my mid 20s getting all this suicidal ideation. And it was a, a marker. It was a revealer. It felt like it's too much. I can't do it. And then it's like, what's too much and what can I do? Right. And that kind of got me to finally face fears and go to therapy. And then that opened the door for more therapy, which opened the door for more therapy. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <laughs> there was quite a bit which opened the door for meditation and it opened mm -hmm. the door for me to to go sit with beautiful teachers and and to find my spiritual path. And and now, thank God, vision pulls more than pain pushes. Mm though on occasion it's pain at my back that's motivating me. It's, mm -hmm. it's different. You know, the equation is flipped and, mm -hmm. you know, Brooke and I talk a lot on Bliss and Grit about there's a phase where you're just doing the best to manage things. Mm -hmm. You're going to manage your anxiety. You're going to manage your anger. You're going to, you know, manage yourself. Yeah. And then there's a stage where you deepen into transformation or hopefully Management was a huge stage. Congratulations, all of us. Mm -hmm. And then you get called to say, wow, management is exhausting. 
I don't want to keep managing my self-deprecation. I want to feel something new. And then you start the transformational work. So we had pain pushing us into management. I think I can speak for Brooke on this. And then pain kept pushing us into transformation. And then the process of transformation has alchemized enough that now it's a lot more vision pulling than anything else. And that's a lovely, fun stage to be at, like the end of that intensity of healing and the beginning of something new, some new potentiality. Yeah. And even though it's foreign, you know, having vision pulling, man, can we really appreciate it after having the pain really be the the grinding force for so long? Yeah. You know, for me personally, I have to work on receptivity to goodness a lot and like creating new internal architecture to be able to perceive and feel safe enough to receive that. But wow, really nice to be able to work on that. <laughs> You know, as opposed to just like the the real grind of trauma therapy and like, wow, you know, I was perceiving through this traumatized lens. So I made a traumatized person's choices. Like I fucked a lot of shit up and like now I got to do a whole lot of real sober adulting. Ooh, it's nice to be into like, how do I learn how to receive goodness? I'll take that. <laughs> I can really appreciate that stage. <laughs> mm. Wow. Since we're almost at the end of our time, do you want to share where people can find you? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> they well, say our in show, unison. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> our show is Bliss and Grit. So there's the website, blissandgrit.com, but it also lives on all of the various and sundry mm -hmm. podcast players as well yes. as on YouTube. And then we have our individual identities too. And so <laughs> my my website's brookthomas.me and uh, you can find other work that I do there. I have a course, digital course coming out late winter called Embodying Safety. That's about mm. how do we have experientially mm -hmm. a living into the feeling of, of safety. And then I'll let Vanessa say where. And then I stuff. am at vanessascotto.com. And I hang out a lot on Instagram. So mm -hmm. you can find me at Vanessa Scotto on Instagram. It's kind of the only social media I like and my favorite. Oh, and at Brooke I'm Thomas 108 is on yeah. there too. And I am on there way less than Vanessa and I admire her social media <laughs> abilities. Very, me, me and Sarah are exchanging yes. a fair amount on our requisite channels. We the, are. We're at Bliss and Grit Podcast. That's usually the one we're, mm -hmm. we're chattering away on, but. Yeah, well, this has just been so wonderful. It's so interesting. I didn't start this podcast as a healing modality for myself, but it has become that. And I, I just want to thank you both for the gifts that you've given me today. And, and I'm sure that the listeners will be feeling the same way. Mm, we totally joy. get that. Bliss and Grit was the same to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't life miraculous and beautiful mm -hmm. that we can have these win-win situations where we win, the person speaking wins, and everybody listening wins. And so... I love that we got to be a part of it. It's yeah. so great. We finally got to do this. Yes. And and I'm excited to get to know you and your listeners more. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Vanessa and Brooke. What a lovely conversation. And truthfully, I knew it when I was speaking with them. There was something in there that was going to be healing for me when I listened back. And sure enough, it absolutely was. So I hope that you found something healing out of the conversation as well. You can find more information about both Brooke and Vanessa at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. And we'll have all of their information in the show notes as well. And thanks as always to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for editing and producing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. Thanks so much for tuning in. Until next time. Bye-bye.